Thanks for joining us on this Sunday. We appreciate you being here for ABC 24 this week. We think it's important to give the week's big stories some context and perspective. So we're here every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 10:35 p.m. to do just that. As always, seems to be the case. We have a lot to get to, so let's show you what's on our plate for today. First up is the Memphis mayoral race. Uh, we now have a decision on the five-year residency rule. A Chancery Court judge deciding it does not apply to any of the candidates running. We'll assess what that means for the contest ahead, leading up to the October election. Guns in the news again. Of course, there's this week's disturbing video of Grizzlies player John Morant that has the NBA investigating. Also, Memphis City Council is pushing for a referendum to let voters decide if handguns should be banned without a permit and all sales of assault rifles banned in Memphis as well. And in the Tyree Nichols case, we learned this week how the lawsuit by his family could impact city government. And also a new law has the state once again taking over, this time keeping cities from having police oversight boards. Before we get to all of that, let me introduce my panel today. Way over there is ABC 24 News political analyst Otis Sanford. Next to him is commercial appeal reporter Catherine Burgess. Burgess or Burgess? Burgess. Okay, sorry about that. And next to me is Reverend Keith Norman, a pastor of First Baptist Broad and also former chairman of the Memphis NAACP chapter as well as former chair of the Shelby County Democratic Party. And sir, I think I'm going to start with you if that's okay. Sounds great. So we want to talk about this mayor's race. You yeah. know, your name was hot and heavy there for a while that you were going to declare a run, but you had said, no, I want to wait and see. Uh, what's decided on this residency issue yes. now that we have a decision are you prepared to say here on the show that I you're am, not going to run? I am, I am prepared to say that I'm not going to run. It would crowd the field and it would not give us a real clear uh, voters perspective on who the voters really want. You're going to see numbers that are going to be very small and someone is going to win this race with probably 50,000 votes out of over 300,000 eligible voters. That's not a good mandate for leadership and I don't want to crowd the field nor be a disruptor so it is time to make clear that we need to have a smaller contingency of people running and we need to have some clear platforms and visions for who's going to be our next mayor. Well, let me follow up with you on that because you do have uh, a plan as we've discussed to maybe talk to some of the candidates. I do. Uh, what, what are your thoughts there and how do you plan to approach that? I plan to approach them. All of them are my colleagues and friends and they have earned the right to be in this race. So I want to respectfully support that right but then we need to talk to them about what does it mean to be a statesperson, a statesman, a stateswoman who will get out of the race when they have not achieved a certain level of voter confidence by way of polling and by way of campaign finance. So it's going to be very important and we need to come and get one or two candidates and get behind them and support them. And correct me if I'm wrong, but in talking to you, it's not so much uh, you really want whoever is the next mayor of the city of Memphis to have support from a clear uh, plurality of Memphis voters because oh. it's hard to articulate a vision and have a mission for this city if you can win by placating to your base and get 50,000 votes. Let's be clear, the mayor doesn't get things done by his or herself. You will need people in the grassroots, the communities, in corporate America, in all of the communities in the outlying areas, downtown, uh, you're going to need New Chicago and Westwood and Binghampton to support you. We've had disengaged people uh, for the last few years who haven't been enthusiastic about what's going on in our city. You're going to need an engaged electorate and people beyond the election to stay engaged and say, let's move our city forward. So will you make an endorsement at I some hope, point? I hope to be able to make an endorsement, but I want everyone listening to let their endorsement be earned and not just by popularity and not just by fundraising or name recognition. Let it be earned by way of this is a platform and a vision that has been clearly articulated that's attainable and not just promises and also a track record of service. So Catherine, I'll throw it to you now. There's a, a poll that came out this week by Case of Public Strategy, margin of error of uh, plus or minus 4%, and uh, they polled 600 people. And uh, the results were show that it's a pretty tight race, really, among the, the so-called front runners. Van Turner, the former county commissioner, 16%. Floyd Bonner, 15%. Uh, Willie Harrington, the former mayor, 14%. And Paul Young with the Downtown Memphis Commission, 12%. Uh, some criticism about the poll. Uh, whites were basically polled at twice the number that actually exists in this city of Memphis is one example of that. But nonetheless, how, how do you read that poll and what it means for the race right now? Mm -hmm. I think the poll kind of affirms part of what we already knew, which is that the people who have rank name recognition are the people who are doing well. Um, we have our current elected officials and our former elected officials are at the top of the poll because people know who they are. Turner and Bonner particularly got a lot of name recognition, a lot of media attention over 
this residency case. What I think surprises me is how Paul Young is creeping up there, getting a little closer. He is definitely from a well-known Memphis family, but he hasn't held an elected role before, so he doesn't have the name recognition of the others, but he's kind of creeping up there, so that's pretty intriguing. And I hear he's been working the meetings hard and shaking mm -hmm. a lot of hands, so he is getting out there. Uh, so, Otis, to you, mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about uh, this residency situation for <laughs> several, several weeks. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad it's over, frankly. Me too. And I credit the judge for making a quick decision here, but we can show the, the faces of who who uh, was most uh, interested, I should say, in the outcome, and that is uh, Sheriff Floyd Bonner, who just moved to uh, Memphis from Bartlett literally months ago, right. uh, and uh, Commissioner, former Commissioner Van Turner, uh, as far as I know, still does not actually live in Memphis. He has a home now in Binghampton, but he doesn't live there because of the Daily Memphis doing a story of finding out that his MLGW bill is basically not, <laughs> there's no water being used there yet. <laughs> no water. Uh, and of course, Paul Young, we mentioned his downtown Memphis commission. Now, he, he has been a resident, uh, but those are basically, would you consider the top four candidates? And then we'll talk about the second tier. Oh, absolutely. I think they're the top four candidates. Uh, we can c criticize that uh, latest poll all we want, but I think those those names are, are very accurate for the reasons that Catherine talked about. Uh, these people have the most name recognition. Uh, Paul Young is raising a lot of money, uh, and so he is getting some support, especially from the business community. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm not surprised to see the four uh, names that are there. Uh, I think the, the Chancery, Chancery Court ruling really helps, uh, obviously, Bonner and Turner. Uh, I still say the biggest winner was Alan Wade. Uh, who had said all along that the residency rule did not apply. <laughs> he's the city council attorney. And he's the city council attorney right. and has been for 30 years or more. Uh, and, you know, he was against, he and the city administration were at odds with each other. Uh, and he came out smelling like a rose on this. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, I think uh, uh, Keith makes some really good points about who is going to be able to move away? Because, you know, 15, 16%, 15%, 14%, uh, and 12%, that's all of them are pretty well lumped up there. Somebody has to make a move to uh, separate themselves, and I haven't seen that yet. No. All right, well, let's uh, look at the second. Well, first I want to show the reaction because I was in interested in how both uh, Sheriff Bonner and Van Turner reacted following the judge's decision. Let's play those sound bites first. Just happy to get it, get it behind us now and move forward with our campaign. Again, I think the mayor, uh, what citizens will want to talk about is uh, public safety and crime. So we're happy to get this behind us and now we can move on with our campaign. It's not necessarily have you lived in the city, but what have you done for the city and what's your plan for the city? I think voters are more interested in those kinds of issues as opposed to you being in the city for five years. Okay, so it's not where you live in the city, but it's what you've done for the city. I like how uh, he's, he's playing that there, the spin. Uh, there's three other, uh, four other, three other candidates that we're kind of keeping an eye on, too. That's the former or present city councilman, Frank Colvett, uh, J.W. Gibson, uh, businessman, and Michelle McKissick, who is the uh, uh, school board member and former chair of the school board. In fact, her campaign, I think, has been maybe the most on it in terms of taking advantage of this whole residency question mm -hmm. and situation. Mm -hmm. I expect we're going to hear from her more, but her statement uh, after the ruling was made was, while the suburban candidates were fighting in court, I was fighting for Memphians. They ask that their leaders live in our city. Buying a home in Memphis simply to run for mayor of Memphis is an integrity issue. Van Turner and Floyd Bonner chose not to live in Memphis for years. Why? Do they think that they are too good for Memphis? What do you think about that kind of... Well, I think it's, a, it's the right way to approach it as a, can, uh, as a candidate. And sure. I would also add that I think taxpayer uh, status needs to be a part of it. I'm fighting for a city. I want to live in a city. I want to pay taxes in that city because a tax base has to be strong in order for a city to move forward. If your tax dollar from your home and from the things that you do on a daily basis are primarily in another city or another area, that's the tax base that you've supported for the last 10 or 15 years. Years. And their police department. And, and their, their police department. Schools. And all of those mm -hmm. things. And so that's a major part of this. People who make a choice to live in the city of Memphis are contributing to moving the agenda forward. We have seen decline in our tax base for the last few years. We need to see that increase. And for our leaders to want to live elsewhere. And, you know, we fought for that when it came to police. We fought for that when it came to citizens. Right. So if other people, if, you're, if your mayor can live somewhere else, wow, what does that say? Yeah. And Catherine, you know, there's a history with this particular issue, whether it be police recruits, uh, 
they need to live in Memphis. Uh, and now mayoral candidates, you would think that might be important to them too. I, I think they want this issue to go away, Bonner and, and Turner, but uh, I, I think they may underestimate how important it is in the minds of a lot of Memphians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was interesting with their answers. They very much deflected from the fact that residency is still an issue. It's not a legal issue at the moment, but it is still an issue in the minds of some voters. And I think people like Michelle McKissick are going to keep going on the attack, keep pushing that, keep that in the forefront of people's minds as we go on and have potentially more debates and more public appearances by the candidates. Yeah, yeah. Otis, you have the last word, and we got to move on. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the candidates who are in that second tier uh, are really going to make a lot of hay about them being suburban candidates. Uh, Michelle has, has gotten that uh, motto out there already and she's going to be hammering that. I'm also hearing one other thing that because Frank Colvett polled so low, I would not be surprised to see another candidate jump in this race uh, after the filing, uh, after the uh, pulling the petitions, mm -hmm. which is next week. Right. And I'm hearing that Worth Morgan could indeed uh, get into this race because he sees that Frank Colvett is not doing anything. That mm -hmm. could not easily right. happen. But then we got more candidates, not fewer. No, <laughs> right. but, but right. he, he has a unique um, position at that mm. point because of the district that he represents, how they vote in lockstep, and that is the same area that was largely the uh, voter base that supported the last mayor. Mm -hmm. And so if that voter base galvanizes itself and the rest of these remain in that 10 to 15 percent range that's an automatic 25 to 30 percent right there mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay we got to keep an eye on it and we have been every week pretty much we're gonna take a break now when we come back we're gonna talk about guns in memphis uh, from the john morant story to the city council trying to take up the issue where the state has not in just a moment